presenting 10 crucial early warning signs of pancreatic cancer necessitating prompt attention. Despite constituting merely 3% of cancer instances in Germany, pancreatic cancer stands out as one of the most feared cancer types. This reputation is well deserved given its grim prognosis. Through this video, my aim is to offer you assurance by helping you identify these unmistakable warning signs at an early stage. Additionally, we will delve into the risk factors associated with pancreatic cancer, empowering you to eradicate these factors from your life and consequently lower your risk. But of course, it's also about early detection screenings. What can you do to discover pancreatic cancer so that you can be absolutely sure you don't have it? Why is pancreatic cancer so feared? Simply because it's usually detected very, very late and often by then it's too late for adequate treatment. In medicine, we give a number or a statistic about five years after being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, only 9% of patients are still alive. That's why it's so crucial to detect it very very, very early. And the second reason is treating pancreatic cancer is anything but a walk in the park involving chemotherapy and radiation. We are mostly talking about the major cutlery draw of abdominal surgery, which is the so-called Whipple procedure. In the Whipple procedure, part of the pancreas is removed, but also the spleen and sometimes part of the stomach, the gallbladder is taken out and parts of the bile ducts. And then all of this is reconnected to a section of the intestine so that the organs can function. So it's a massive operation. And before we start with the early warning signs, just a quick note at the end of this video, I'll give a really golden tip for people who are already suffering from pancreatic cancer. I see it time and time again that the number one main symptom unfortunately doesn't get much attention from many, many colleagues. There is no one size fits all solution, but by the conclusion of the video, I will delve into strategies to address the primary symptom that emerges during treatment as a result of pancreatic cancer. Let's kick things off by exploring the primary early warning sign of pancreatic cancer, a symptom that approximately 90% of individuals with this disease report during its initial stages. Typically, pancreatic cancer presents itself through unintended weight loss. While unintended weight loss can have various causes, it often serves as a subtle yet significant indicator of cancer. This symptom is frequently seen among cancer patients, with pancreatic cancer particularly standing out in this regard. The reason for this lies in the cancer's ability to activate specific immune system messengers known as cytokines. These messengers play a role in disrupting the body's hormonal and metabolic balance, leading to the depletion of both fat and muscle mass. Proteins are broken down and the synthesis of new proteins is slowed. Essentially, we're shifting into a catabolic metabolism. Then, of course, there's the issue with the pancreas itself. It normally produces enzymes that help break down nutrients in the gastrointestinal tract, to put it simply. And that's where additional symptoms triggered by the disease come into play, such as nausea, vomiting, and a feeling of early satiety. You just feel full much quicker, and there's a loss of appetite. And then, of course, there can be additional issues like intestinal problems, constipation, uh, diarrhea, and such. And this whole package can lead to weight loss, Moving on to the second early warning sign of pancreatic cancer, which about 80% of patients report, and that's actually abdominal pain. Either pain that's hard to pinpoint or the typical belt-like pains that we feel from front to back, like a belt tightening around the stomach area. Those are the typical pains associated with pancreatic diseases. And the question, of course, is why does it cause pain? Many types of cancer can progress silently. But with pancreatic cancer, the pancreas can become severely inflamed as part of the inflammation or the cancer itself. This leads to the production of pain mediators and the fasci and so on can become inflamed. It can also lead to functional disorders such as bile duct obstruction or digestive problems or even metastasis into the surrounding tissue if the disease has progressed further. And all of this combined can indeed cause typical abdominal pain. So if you're suffering from abdominal pain over an extended period, please have it checked out. What are actually the risk factors for pancreatic cancer? And there's good news here because you can eliminate many of these factors from your life. For example, smoking, which increases the risk of pancreatic cancer by 3.5 times, or alcohol consumption, which increases the risk by 2.5 times. 
With pre-existing conditions, the outlook isn't as good. That means there's not as much you can do. For instance, people who have had stomach surgery face an approximately three to seven fold increased risk of developing pancreatic cancer. Then there's a major factor, which is diet. Here again, you can take active steps. It's about the consumption, the regular consumption to be precise. Eating smoked and grilled foods can indeed increase the risk of pancreatic cancer. Additionally, there's the risk associated with being overweight. So if you're overweight, there's evidence suggesting a higher tendency towards pancreatic cancer. Additionally, there are toxins that we can eliminate from our lives, such as heavy metals, nickel, benzene and solvents. Research indicates that these substances can trigger pancreatic cancer. Therefore, it's important to regularly detoxify and cleanse your body. Consider methods like phytoconversion or other detox strategies to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Then there's genetics. And with genetics, these are simply factors that unfortunately you can't control. It's just bad luck. There are people who have a chronic genetically inherited pancreatitis or a genetic reason for inflammation of the pancreas, a chronic inflammation of the pancreas. And in these cases, the risk for pancreatic cancer is also increased. And then there are families. In these families, due to hereditary pancreatitis, there's a higher occurrence of pancreatic cancer through the generations. Moving on to the third early warning sign, which is jaundice or icterus. About 70% of all patients experience this, and many might say, well, that's already a late sign. But the issue with pancreatic cancer is that it's often detected so late. There are indeed people who initially don't notice anything, or of course, they notice something's not right, something's off, I'm sick and then they delay their doctor's appointment, possibly overlooking that the tumor growth has already reached the bile ducts. The pancreas is located near the main bile duct, so the tumor can block it, leading to this icterus, this yellowing of the skin. The cause is that the bile flow is obstructed, preventing the breakdown of bilirubin. is no longer properly maintained. Bilirubin is, after all, the breakdown product of our blood pigment. And this bilirubin can no longer be transported to the intestine. It accumulates in the blood. And that's precisely the condition of jaundice. And advanced pancreatic cancer can, of course, also impair liver function, liver metastasis, greatly feared. And so, through this pathway, attacks on the liver, there can also be an increased rise in bilirubin levels. Which brings us right to the fourth early warning sign, which is loss of appetite or nausea. About half, 40 to 50% of all those affected report this. Why? Of course, the pancreas is a digestive organ. It produces digestive juices that are essential for breaking down proteins, carbohydrates, and so on. And the tumor can, of course, block the function of these digestive juices, which can lead to nausea, loss of appetite, and just general digestive problems. Also, pressure on the stomach. So when people say they always feel bloated after eating, they can't eat much anymore. That too can be a tumor pressing there. And then, of course, we also have the effects of hormones, of chemicals that the pancreas produces, which when disrupted in their process can really affect the appetite and so forth. Let's look at the fifth early warning sign, which is newly developed diabetes mellitus. About 15% of pancreatic patients report this, so let's take a closer look at what the pancreas actually does. Within the pancreas, there are indeed two distinct components functioning. The initial component is the exocrine segment which is accountable for creating digestive fluids that assist in the breakdown of carbohydrates, fats and proteins. Furthermore, the pancreas emits substantial levels of alkaline substances, including bicarbonate. This feature presents a formidable obstacle during surgical procedures and treatment because it establishes an exceedingly potent alkaline milieu. The second aspect of the pancreas is the endocrine portion responsible for producing two hormones, one of which is the widely recognized insulin. Insulin is synthesized within the beta cells located in the islets of Langerhans, playing a vital role in controlling blood sugar levels to ensure that that the sugar they absorb is pushed into the muscle cell, lowering the blood sugar level. And then we have the antagonist. And the antagonist is called glucagon. And this hormone glucagon ensures that when you're hypoglycemic, your lovely glycogen reserves, your long-term sugar reserves in the liver are tapped into releasing glucose so that you have a healthy blood sugar level again. 
And if a tumor interferes with this balance or this hormonal interplay, then a blood sugar fluctuation can develop very quickly from this. And you can see dramatic blood sugar fluctuations or even the onset of diabetes mellitus. How can you actually diagnose pancreatic cancer? Regularly, the first indications may emerge in the course of a standard blood test, for instance, heightened white blood cell levels or escalated inflammation markers, along with pancreas-specific parameters like lipase or amylase. These act as initial hints that lead to more in-depth diagnostic investigation. An upper abdominal ultrasound can be immediately carried out, which entails an external ultrasound examination where the probe is applied externally on the abdominal wall to further explore the evaluation. But of course we can do additional imaging like a CT scan which then provides us with insights, just the classic tube. But there is a gold standard and I'd like to explain this gold standard to you. It's the ultrasound examination of the stomach's interior. That's called endoscopic ultrasonography. You're familiar with endoscopy, right? So when we perform a gastroscopy, the doctor looks directly inside the stomach and we can take images images and here's the probe at the front. So you attach an ultrasound probe to the end of the endoscope. This means you bring the ultrasound close to the pancreas and can then examine everything from the inside. This provides the best results. And then we have two interesting tumor markers. Tumor markers aren't blood values used to detect pancreatic cancer or other types of cancer early on. They are parameters to monitor the course of the disease. And here we have two crucial elements to take into account. CA-199, the primary marker for monitoring the progression of pancreatic cancer. Subsequently, individuals may need to visit their doctor two, three or four times a year after completing the entire treatment process. This blood value is taken repeatedly and then the doctor can see if it starts to rise again whoops, I need to get back into my more detailed diagnostics. And this parameter can be easily measured in the blood. It's important to know that it can increase not only with pancreatic cancer, but also with bile duct cancer or pancreatitis, liver diseases and so on. That's why it's not suitable for diagnosing this disease. And another parameter, CEA, is used for colorectal cancer and other types of cancer. We can also use this tumor marker to monitor the course of the disease. Let's talk about another early warning sign, which is vomiting. It occurs in about 15% of all cases. And what's the cause? Tumor growth can lead to pressure on the gastrointestinal tract. The duodenum, for instance, can be compressed, disrupting the normal passage of digestive chyme, which can then lead to vomiting or trigger vomiting. Of course, we often have liver and bile duct issues that come into play with pancreatic cancer. But of course, we also have psychological factors, stress, anxiety, mental strain from the cancer. All of this can add up during the course of treatment so that vomiting can be triggered again and again. Moving on to another early warning sign, which is fatty stool or pale stool. And here we have an anatomical peculiarity. The duct where the pancreatic secretions and the bile duct secretions are delivered this duct is anatomically close. So it can happen that the tumor growth of the pancreas then presses on the bile duct, to put it plainly. And then this bile duct is compressed or blocked and we know that the bile salts, the bile acids and so on, the bile secretion are responsible for giving the stool its brown color. Without it, without these bile pigments, we have the problem that the stool becomes almost white, it gets really, really pale. So if bilirubin, the breakdown products, no longer reach the intestine, then the stool becomes much, much lighter. Yes, sometimes even clay colored. And then of course, it can happen that the bile cannot flow out in sufficient quantity, leading to problems with fat digestion, which can also cause a change in stool color. This brings us to early warning sign number eight, elevated bilirubin levels in the stool and in the blood jaundice. But here we're talking about dark urine because this bilirubin, just a reminder, is the breakdown product of our red blood pigment, which can cause the skin to turn yellow if it's deposited there or the stool to become discolored or the urine to turn dark. And the significant question that arises is what proactive measures can one take to reduce the risk of pancreatic cancer? 
Initially, strive to lead a healthy lifestyle and eradicate potential risk factors. This involves abstaining from alcohol and nicotine. Furthermore, research indicates that a fiber-rich diet may offer protection against cancer, while a diet rich in meat and unhealthy fats, specifically refined fats, not the beneficial ones, has been linked to a higher likelihood of developing the disease. Additionally, there is a fascinating aspect because we see that herbicides, fungicides or even fuel vapors, benzene, things like that, pesticides, chlorinated hydrocarbons and so on can contribute to making it much, much easier for pancreatic cancer or cancer in general to develop. That means always make sure to detoxify your body. For example, with phytoremediation or now the very new liposomal glutathione. It's a topic of much debate. I've put the link in the description. So keep stimulating the liver's biotransformation so it doesn't accumulate toxins. Of course, using the sauna can be very, very helpful in this regard. Please watch the videos I've made on my channel about saunas. For instance, bisphenol A, this plasticizer that we really struggle to eliminate from our bodies, is best excreted through sweat. This has been measured in saunas. And then, of course, we also have two classic symptoms that we must always keep an eye on. They're part of the so-called B symptoms, which are fever and night sweats. So remember this, fever, night sweats and weight loss are the three B symptoms that can indicate cancer. And now let's talk about the symptom we announced, which is many, many people experience it for the first time with pancreatic cancer after surgery, but it's also a clear early warning sign and that's diarrhea. Of course, there are reasons for this, like poor enzyme production, which leads to difficulty digesting fats, proteins, carbohydrates and proteins. All of this can be poorly digested and the body may respond with diarrhea as an early warning sign. But people who have already had surgery, they lose their gallbladder, they lose part of their stomach, they might lose part of their intestines, they lose part of their pancreas. And this leads to what's called bile acid malabsorption syndrome. And this is a very, very severe condition. People essentially have constant diarrhea and nothing helps except for one thing. And I am repeatedly deeply shocked. I think it's an absolute scandal that these patients are not told by their oncologists, hey, there's this substance called cholesteramine, this substance it's very safe with a very, very low risk of side effects. It can take care of the diarrhea overnight. And I've recommended it so, so often in my practice here for patients with pancreatic cancer who didn't have this information. Why is this important? A cancer patient can't afford to lose more weight, especially if they're constantly suffering from diarrhea. How are the nutrients supposed to be absorbed? There's no way to gain weight with ongoing diarrhea. They're likely already very weakened from the onset of the illness to the diagnosis and then from the diagnosis, possibly undergoing chemotherapy, radiation, or the major Whipple procedure. So please, please share this video with people you know who have pancreatic cancer or who, you know, are dealing with this issue. There's this substance, this magical substance called cholesteramine, and it's a really, really big help. Feel free to subscribe to my channel, become a channel member. I appreciate all the channel members who support this channel in our next live channel discussion. We'll talk about cancer again. We'll delve into some details and discuss the most, most important um, blood host for viruses and cancer so you're protected. I haven't made a video about that on this channel yet. That's coming up in the live channel event. A truly explosive cancer protection that you can measure in your blood. It just has to fit. Thank you for watching. Please share this video and I'll see you in the next one. See you soon.